morning. morning. Just some announcements to uh, start. Um, In Dennis's absence, if you need pastoral support, uh, don't be asking me, please. (laughs) But on his answer phone number, uh, you'll get the details that you need if you need some pastoral support or care from a professional. So just phone the the usual number and I'll be on his answer phone. Uh, Second announcement is, um, really from the vestry as a whole, um, the vestry would really appreciate it if anybody would be willing to volunteer on a Thursday night uh, for the works team. Uh, Nigel heads up the works team and it's, it's coming to the limit of what can really be achieved and it's it's because of um, the number of people involved, it's getting less and less. So they would really appreciate it if some people could be out uh, sometimes on a Thursday night to, for cutting grass or uh, helping around the, uh, around the outside of the church. Um, just to jog your, your memory as you're going out, you may want to do that, but you might forget after the announcement. Uh, Nigel will be out at the door with me at the end of the service. Okay. No sticks or, or baseball bats or anything to force you to do it, but we would encourage you to do it. And just another thing, um, just be aware at the end of the service again, please, um, if you could just go out one row from the back, one row at a time, and please be conscious of that, um, just for, this, for the, the need for health and safety in these difficult times still. Uh, I know many of you have a vaccine, but this is... We do these things out of consideration for those that don't as well. Thank you. Okay, so we now begin our service. The Lord be with you. So we take time now to to begin our time of worship with, with praise of God. And the first song, the first hymn this morning is Lamb of God. Thank you. 
Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. So we have praised God together. And as we begin, we take this time to remember who we are before him. We are made in his image, but as we know ourselves, we are so deeply flawed. And so we come again together to ask for his grace, his mercy, and forgiveness. So let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We trust in God's grace. And so we say together, O oh Lord, open our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We think we need to be in a, a southern and the United Southern United States to sing to say that. Praise the Lord, the Lord's name be praised. So we come now to a part of the morning prayer liturgy called the Venite, and this is the first seven verses of Psalm 95. And as you listen to these words, we need to remember that this is an invitation to worship the Lord. He's not just our Savior, but also our Creator. But the very blood that runs through our veins is there because of him. He is God over all creation. He is God above all things. Unlike what, what we sometimes hear in, on, in, the social, in social media like YouTube if we're watching something, he's not just another being in creation that can be found. He's so much more than that. So much above and beyond creation. So the Venite begins. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peak of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is the Lord, our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, shall be forever. Amen. So now George is going to come to read today's scripture. Thank you. Today's reading is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. 
Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposed to you. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, George. Thank you. And thank you, Dennis, for also giving me another great um, passage to read from. Uh, he's not here, but I did send on my thanks to him by text, and he, he just sent back a, a smiley face. So we come this morning to the last sermon for James in this series. So today we'll be looking at chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, as, as George has read to us, and again, thank you. Now, I don't know about you, um, but we're doing James in the Bible study as well, and I have found James a difficult letter to study because it is unrelentingly challenging. He doesn't write the letter the way Paul does in Philippians to tell us, you're doing great, keep going. Rather, he writes to provoke us to change. And I don't know about you, but in going through this letter, I've found this difficult. A difficult to read and assess against my own life. So James is writing to little congregations in a context that seems very different from our own. These little congregations are under pressure. And while they're probably not facing martyrdom, as other congregations might, they're being socially and economically disadvantaged. They're being pushed to the side by the wider culture. Now this still happens. I remember back, um, it was in 2008, in Andiat, I think, I went to a country in Eastern Europe in a short-term mission, and I met a man there called Samir. And he had converted to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And since then, his wife and he had been shunned by their families, and they had lost his job because he was a Christian. How would that happen here? Could it happen here? Well, probably not. But how does, a pers- how does a person like him react? Does he give up his faith? Does he just say, forget it, it's not worth it? Or does he continue to, to live a life of faith in Jesus Christ? So James isn't, still, isn't yet so far away from us that it's not pertinent. And he's concerned with two issues, particularly in these verses. Firstly, he is concerned about believers adopting the morals of those who are oppressing him, oppressing them, sorry. And secondly, he is concerned about the infighting within congregations. So for James, 
The same is for Paul in Philippians. The unity of the church and the threats to disrupt that unity are of a special importance. And for James, one of the main risks to unity is the unjustness and unfairness that occurs when people focus on wealth. The group that, group that James calls in this passage the rich are the same group that Jesus and the Old Testament prophets have constantly railed against. They are the materially wealthy. And they are condemned for their selfish accumulation and abuse of their riches. So James isn't saying anything new out on the edge of the, of the Bible. This is a recurrent theme throughout the Bible from, the, from Exodus on. And we seem to sometimes in these day, these day and ages be obsessed with uh, identity, be obsessed with uh, relations between men and women or, or whatever those relations are. But a stronger theme running through the whole Bible is wealth and the danger of it. They are the materially wealthy. And James hopes that believers might hear about the, the miserable end that these rich, faith, rich face. And, they may dis- and he hopes that the congregations might decide that, not, that will not envy that wealth, but will rather be patient and wait for God to sort these things out. So in chapter 5, verse 1, James tells the rich that they should weep and wail. And again, these are, ver- these are words that are found time and time again as words of judgment. I would love it if the Bible didn't talk about judgment. I really would. But that is the reality of the Bible and of God's people. But what is evil about having riches? What's the problem? Well, in the next five verses, James makes four points. And the first one is that the rich have hoarded their wealth and they fail to use it to help the poor and needy. James says that money and possessions are rotting and corroding, which is saying that it's just sitting there unused. It's wasted. It's done nothing for the poor and it hasn't even done anything for them. It's just a measure of what rich people think is their value. And again, James isn't saying anything different from Jesus. In Luke 12, Jesus says, sell your possessions to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Now clearly, not everybody heeds Jesus' words, so James has to reiterate them. Because condemnation is not far behind. Again, thanks to Dennis for for giving me these words to say. But these are words that are so hard for ministers to say. Because the congregation might feel that that they're invested in, in getting money off you for some reason. But that is not what James is concerned about. That is not what these words are about. The second point is in verse 4. Because the rich, despite their wealth, fail to pay their laborers what is owed them. Time and again, and again in the Old Testament, the prompt payment of wages for people is an important part of Jewish law. So this is not a new thing that James is talking about. It is the perennial problem of injustice. James informs the wealthy that God, the judge of all things, is well aware of these sins. These sins against those who depend upon others for their daily bread. The third reason is about living a luxurious, self-indulgent lifestyle. And when you read this passage, you see that James is talking about um, being fattened for the slaughter. And you can think of, in, the, in, the, in this time, 
to celebrate, look, rich people would have fattened calves ready for slaughter to eat for their frequent celebrations of their success. The irony is that James uses it as a word of judgment. That the luxuries we, we, we fill up with are what we fatten for our own slaughter, our own judgment. Now this is strong, visceral, graphic language that's designed to have an impact. James is saying that we need to take this behavior very seriously. And I personally would prefer to forget about this. I'm not making an apology for James, but I would prefer to forget about this. But James is crystal clear about the implications. Finally, verse 6 sees James condemn the rich for their influential social and political positions that allow them to condemn and murder those who are in right standing before God, those who are righteous. And here James is talking about those who persecute the wealthy, political and religious elites who persecute the early Christians and who in fact persecuted Christ. There was nothing new to the faithful for suffering. Again, it starts back in Exodus with Pharaoh. And we've seen just more and more Pharaohs line up through history to act unjustly towards those in need. Jesus was one of them. So if you read our Bibles, The dangers and perils of wealth, as I've said, are found throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And these four points that James raises after 2,000 years are still around. They have not disappeared. In our modern world, we might be more technologically advanced. But are we more morally advanced? Have we progressed in our ethics and in our lifestyles. And money is a, is, a, is a contentious issue in the church, as I've mentioned. Why do we get so offended when we raise issues of wealth in the church and yet when it's a, a, a significant theme throughout the whole of the Bible? Why is this? So say you're a Christian You're working hard to learn more about God and live more like Jesus. Great. You read your Bible every day. You pray every day. You go to church. And you even go to the prayer meeting. I should remind you, for those who have booked in, there's a prayer meeting on Wednesday at 8 in Portland Own Church. Great. And you go not because it's a duty, but because it's a joy. Because you delight in praising God and getting to know him better. That's great. And you think of the time we spend doing that and the joy we find in it. But you think of the time over the week from this Sunday to next. Think of the time when we find ourselves vulnerable to the pressure to conform to the world that says it's good to be be greedy. Because that's what it's about. Greed. We might be well off. We might be well off. Or we might be envious of those who are better off. But how much of our time is spent thinking about our value, our status, and what we need to feel good? Because us as as fallen humans, we seem to love collecting trophies in life. We're saturated with a desire to want more, to desire more, And that it's good when we have something. If you have more money, a third level education, if you own a house, if you drive a good car, have a good career, then you'll be satisfied or you'll be on top. Or you'll be feeling secure. That your little castle walls are secure and that no one can get in. You'll be safe. Or you'll be better than the Joneses down the road those people who we've envied for so long. And this is the good news 
that we keep on getting told. This gospel of adverts and consumerism and capitalism. But the Bible reminds us time and time again that this is not the good news. This is a lie. Because James is deeply concerned, not just in this passage, but throughout the letter, about loving our neighbor. As we mentioned in the Bible study, this is what he calls the royal law. The royal law, the law that comes from the king, King Jesus. Can we love our neighbor? The problem is the trophies we accumulate get in the way. We have our love of others and our love of God himself. And let's call that for what it really is, as idolatry. Because our wealth can make us cold to God and other people. I don't say, speak on your behalf, I speak on my own. St. Augustine was very clear about what our Christian pilgrimage is all about. Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And Augustine spent his youth in a desperate search for fulfillment. And you can read his confessions, his book, The Confessions, to discover his search. But in the end, wealth and success, he just found were ashes in his hands. He found no meaning in his successes when they were all about himself. The restlessness we have we have inside us that we try to assuage by getting more will not stop until we decide to walk down another path. So what are Christians to be like? For James, writing to congregations that are disenfranchised, that they're marginalized by the rest of society, it might have been easy to side with them and be bitter and frustrated about wanting what others have. And that bitterness and frustration is so often what we see in other movements and ideologies and political ideas throughout history. When we feel disenfranchised and bitter and angry, and we do see genuine injustice, what do we do? Well, we lead to a revolution, and often a violent revolution. We think of the Marxist and communist and fascist movements that started off with with perceived injustice and sometimes real injustice. But what happens? When the victors get into the parliament, what happens? They've replaced greedy people, rich people, wealthy, influential, powerful people. What happens? Well, the same desires eat away at them. And what we see throughout history, revolution after revolution, is a cycle of greed. The originally greedy are removed, and the new greedy take over. What's the problem? Well, the difference in the Christian revolution that began with Jesus is that unlike these other movements, when we see injustice, we speak out and we tell the truth, yes, injustice, but we also forgive. These other movements, there is no forgiveness. You're either like us or you disappear. Our truth-telling invites repentance and forgiveness. For James' response to the people who are struggling, what is, their, what is his response to them? Patience. Not envy or bitterness or hatred, but patience. To be patient and trust that God is judge and not us. Yes, we speak truthfully to injustice. But not to take judgment into our own hands. 
We are to be patient until Jesus comes and sets things right. James is not speaking as just another person who wants to give insipid advice to sort of to improve your well-being, even though you're you're down at the bottom. Because he is someone who is someone who has encountered that suffering firsthand. But he has also encountered the risen, living Christ. And that changes everything. So as as advice to people like Samir, who I met, to be patient. And as the word says, as George's words rang out this morning from James, to persevere, to endure. Following Jesus is not a career choice or a lifestyle choice. It's a life and death choice for many. It might be for us. Because our faith is based on the fact that this world will be sorted out when Jesus returns. And we're asked to live now as if he was returning. In the future, we will love God and neighbor perfectly. But in the here and now, we're asked to look at Jesus and to see how he treats people and to mimic that. Think about his teaching. Read his teaching. Think how that can impact us today. Because what Jesus taught in the Gospels is how we are to live now. Greed is still a reality. So we have to learn from Jesus how to react against that. Because that is the way we will live in the future as well, when he comes. James also points us to that patience and perseverance when we look at the prophets of the Old Testament, especially Job. These people went under the same temptations and desires. Think of Job and his being told by his wife to abandon God or blame him. But they persevere. They look around them and see the, t- the trouble. And they don't give up or decide to walk a different path. They remain undistracted. Our world seems to enjoy distracting us. It's like that, moment by moment, advert. If you notice even, if you look at the television of the 1970s to the television now, the time spent on a particular frame has moved from maybe several seconds to change, change, change. We live and our minds are being changed by being distracted and being unable to concentrate. And the more we are distracted, the harder it is for us to avoid the temptations that come our way. And those temptations that damage ourselves and our conscience, but also other people. So this is an invitation from James to stop accumulating. And we live in a world where, as I said, where that accumulation is a given. Our whole political and economic and social systems become about grabbing as much as possible. Especially now because we don't know when the next economic crisis or the next uh, serious event may come. We grab as individuals, we grab as companies, we grab as countries. Our world is in a spiral of debt, but yet we still gamble vast amounts of money in the markets, while about half the population is living on about four pounds a day. Half the population of the world is living on about four pounds today, a day. And our own grasping creates an environment where poor people work in horrific conditions to allow us, the affluent, to have a lifestyle undreamt of even by kings and queens in the past. I'm not complaining about technology that keeps me alive and has kept me alive. But do we have the moral conscience to continue down this path? Because we know injustice against the poor happens. 
And when we see it on TV, we may shake our, head, our heads and see, oh, those poor people. But we have to acknowledge that in much of what we do, we're complicit in that misery. For example, if you think in the news a few years ago, when Apple and other companies were, uh, were found to be unconcerned about the treatment of thousands upon thousands of Chinese workers. Now we know this. We know the treatment of these people who build our technology. How many of us would move from our iPhones, which, are, which has become a status symbol, to our little cheap Nokia, if we knew about the ethical implications? How far does love of neighbor really go? Now, Gordon, you might respond, well, you're just sounding like a hippie from the 1960s. Do we really want to go back there? But I think this is about living in generous and just ways. When you read about revivals in the past in church history, like the Methodists and other groups, it didn't just affect their spiritual lives, it also affected their wallet. Do we restlessly continue to covet the next thing? Imagine that that, that that is what makes us satisfied. That next thing could be the coffee maker or the new house or the new car or a new kitchen. It could be anything. Because we are in the world that we want and we want and we want. And I worry that my own consumer lifestyle, my own retail therapy, has made me less human. When I think of people, of Christians I have met in other countries, I'm not suggesting here that they don't suffer the same temptations, but they seem to be much freer. They seem to have more peace. We go back to what Augustine said. We may have a great job, a great house, a great everything, but do we remain restless? Where do we find our rest? Now, I don't imagine that these words are easy to stomach. And I've been stuck reading James, these verses, for for two weeks now. And it would have have been nice to to have worked around them and to make this message more palatable for us. But if I did, I fear fear I would not be faithful to those words. And that's something I can't do, I dare not do, because James told me that teachers are judged more harshly. I don't have an answer to the economic crises of today or the economic challenges or to how to rid ourselves of greed. I'm not an economist or a politician. I'm just a lay reader, just lay, not even a minister. But James and the text of scripture tells me there is a solution to start with. And even as Dennis said like last week, is to submit to the true king. To have him as our redeemer, as our savior, from judgment. And as our teacher. To learn from him how to resist temptation. And to learn from from Jesus Christ, the crucified, risen and ascended Lord, what it means to be generous with our, with our lives. He gave his life for you and I, and we know who we are. And he asks us to be generous with our lives, to be open-handed and not close-fisted. Now, over the past few weeks since Easter, James has tried to provide us 
all with these wise words. Wise words. But as we have read them, and I encourage you to go and read them again, what do we make of it? We have time now, it's summer. Most of us will be taking holidays at some time to relax. Hopefully to see friends and family again as the country opens up a bit more. Even to get off to the beach. But can we find rest, true rest, from our own restlessness? That rest is only found in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that. The words in the Bible tell me that. I invite you to pray with me now. Father, this message of James, your servant, has been deeply challenging. Father, this world around us, even as we walk out of church and turn on the television, is just full of distractions. We're told to be busy, to desire to grasp. Help us to find rest and peace in you. Help us to find patience with what we have and where we're placed. Help us to repent if we need to repent. And help us to thank you that you have given us a difference, a different way of life, an eternal life. Amen. I didn't, I didn't find that easy to write. And I ask if, if I have offended you accidentally, I, I am truly sorry. It's, I, the sermon was for me as much as for anyone. But we continue on with our service because we're invited to worship this God who gives us forgiveness, who gives us mercy, who has given us Jesus. So I, I invite you, if, if you will, stand with me as we profess to the God who has revealed himself to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to say the Apostles' Creed. So please stand. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ. God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father, guard in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O oh, oh Lord. O oh Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O oh Lord, save your people. 
Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us. Our collect for today. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply on, upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but remember that we are always walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So now we come to that time of prayer for ourselves and for others. I would like us, as we bring this time of intercessory prayer before God, if we take time to pray for those who we know personally who are in need. And then I will continue the prayer afterwards. So let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for your creation and all that you richly provide. Enable us to live in such a way that we can see what is enough. And enable us to live in such a way that your majesty and mercy are seen by all. Father, all governments rule under your authority. May they work for the good of those they rule, seeking your justice and peace in law and action. Enable those who are engaged in industry and, com and commerce, in the media and education, in leisure and the arts. Enable them to fulfill their responsibilities with integrity and an attitude of service. Almighty God, who is all-powerful, comfort and strengthen those who mourn or, or who are gripped by poverty, who are weakened by illness or oppressed by cruelty. May they know your love and experience your care. Father, inspire your church here on earth to proclaim your good news of, of your love in the death and resurrection of your son. May all people hear the call to trust you. Almighty God, all powerful one, help your people to display your compassion to all those in need. May the poor and the lost of this world find in you their true wealth and sure destiny. As we seek to live for you, Father, refresh and equip us to be your faithful and obedient people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we come to our final hymn today. There is a Redeemer.
So we've finished today's service. And we have praised and we have confessed. We have heard God's word read to us. And we have prayed for ourselves and for others. Now as we leave, I, I encourage you to remember the God who is ours. Who will forgive. Who can say the past is the past. Start anew. We have been challenged by James' words. But in forgiveness and mercy we can be refreshed. And I pray that this is a time when God has spoken to you personally. The Lord be with you. Let us bless that Lord. May the, hope of, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the Holy Spirit you may be bound in hope. Amen. Amen. Just as we finish, please remember to leave from the back one row at a time for your own safety. Thank you.